to open us in a prayer. Well, before we pray, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. If you haven't already done so, I'm going to ask us first for a moment to pray with our eyes wide open, to look around the room and to see those who are amongst us, with us, to see the faces. And do you notice that as you look in the faces of one another, that you get a little glimpse of what God looks like? My mother taught me to pray with my eyes open. Not that I don't close my eyes most of the time, but I know she knew how to pray with her eyes open because when we were sitting next to her in church or wherever we happened to be, and we thought that she was so engrossed in the service that she couldn't see the little antics we were up to, we would just feel a little arm come over and just pop. She always said, we need to pray with our eyes open. And we know right now that our world is more challenged probably than ever. You know, we think about the 50s and the 60s and all the turmoil, but you know, we've got some stuff going on right now Amen. that require us to pray with our eyes wide open. Right. I welcome you to Forest Hill Church. And we're so happy that you are here and those of you who are live streaming and joining us in that way, because GCC is up to good trouble. They have been involved in that kind of work for uh, what the past 10 years and no less so tonight. So we are here to bear witness and to be a part of this great work by the grace of God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, you in whose image we are each made, you who are God of us all and God of all there is, we look to you. We thank you that you bring us together, Lord, from different backgrounds and different families and different religious communities and somehow you have managed to make us one. This is a testament to your unifying presence and spirit among us all. So right now we ask that you would rain down blessings upon all of those who are gathered, be, be they in this sanctuary or joining us from live stream we pray that you would fill our hearts and our spaces and our minds, our thoughts, our perceptions with all that glorifies you and that speaks truth about who you are, a God of love. This we pray in your name and we thank you because we can welcome one another simply because you have already welcomed us. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. 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 Good evening, GCC. Good evening. I am the Reverend Juwan Zakoven, pastor of the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church one of the founding congregations of Greater Cleveland Congregations. It is great to be with you on this evening. Tonight, we gather as one community in person and virtual to continue our battle for democracy, to form a more perfect union. We know that our democracy is only as strong as we are informed, engaged, and empowered to build a tomorrow that benefits us all. And we know that democracy starts and ends with people, with people. And this effort, our battle for democracy has with all of our work in the past from expanding Medicaid 
to reducing felony charges, addressing gun safety, creating equitable access to COVID testing and vaccines, to establishing the state's first crisis diversion center, it began and remains about people. We walked neighborhood blocks, we knocked on resident doors, and we asked them the question, what do you want to see from those elected to serve? The system your taxes support and the government consented by us to serve all of us, regardless of who you are, how you look, who you love, where you live, or the God you serve. And throughout this campaign and over the years of the thousands of people we have touched and met through door to doors and one on ones and phone calls, house meetings in our churches, synagogues and temples, we raise a question that will drive tonight's meeting. Where is the investment? Cuyahoga County and the city of Cleveland have invested hundreds of millions of dollars continuing to expand and sustain the same system which has failed our youth and perpetuated outcomes which continue to disproportionately and negatively impact the poor and those less fortunate in our community. Cuyahoga County in 2011 opened the doors to a juvenile justice center in the heart of the black communities of Fairfax and Woodhill to the tune of a cost of taxpayers of $189 million. This facility houses our juvenile courts. It is a holding facility for our youth and is a place where dreams of a reformed future for so many of our young people go to die. Where's the investment in diversion programs? alternative sentencing, youth in crisis intervention, summer educational and enrichment programs to uplift, educate our youth, to keep them safe and steer them away from a future of incarceration at a time when we can make an early impact on prior to and when they first enter into the juvenile justice system. Where is the investment? Right now, the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County are finalizing details to build a 1,600 bed jail at a cost of over half a billion dollars. At a time when we spent a fraction of that cost in job training, workforce development and community asset building, we ask, where is the investment? As we speak on the Opportunity Corridor, a road which takes you through central Slavic village and Fairfax neighborhoods, the city of Cleveland is planning to build a $100 million police headquarters. Where's the opportunity in that for our seniors? Parents and families trying to create a community in spaces where more money is being spent on policing black lives than imagining and reinvesting to transform those lives. Where is the investment? Greater Cleveland Congregations, GCC will not let me say again, we will not let business proceed as usual. We will not let the wheels of democracy and bureaucracy roll on as if nothing is wrong. Nothing is amiss, no moral oversight, no moral blind spot, as if a correction is not needed. We have come here tonight to continue the work of getting Cuyahoga County democracy back on track. We have seen voter turnout numbers continue to decline election season after election season. We have seen members of our community, family, and congregation become increasingly disinterested and disengaged from exercising their civic duty and constitutional right, that's duty and right to vote. Not because of simply of voter suppression, but because of voter depression. But we have also heard why. Why you ask? because thousands upon thousands of people that live in the city and throughout this county don't see their vote making a difference in the decisions and the outcomes that are coming from City Hall, the county administration building, or the Justice Center downtown. For many, an apathy has set in, which seems to suit some in office who use voter apathy to their advantage. 
But GCC, through its work, we continue to wake up the sleeping giants. Yes. Because the answer to all of us is you and I, is us. Those here tonight, those who are watching, we assembled here, those who are watching tonight online and live stream, our congregations, our neighborhoods coming together across the lines that society says separates us and using those lines to bind us together to say together, city and county, Cleveland and Cuyahoga, black, white, and brown, church and synagogue. There will be a brighter future for our youth. There will be a more equitable system of justice, and there will be greater investment in our neighborhood. So help us God. Tonight, we will state our case. But for those who have chosen to lead, persons who want to lead our county and determine the fate of some of our youth, you will ask them hard questions. We will hear responses and listen with a prophetic ear for their commitment to imagining and reimagining and reinvesting in a way to get different results. But not only will we ask questions, not only will we listen to their responses, but we commit to, to work with them if elected to bring about change, but also commit to them and to ourselves to hold them accountable. So tonight, we look forward to watching democracy unfold before our very eyes by raising issue awareness, by hearing from those deeply affected, by listening to those who would take the mantle to serve and calling for a course correction in direction and listening for a new vision. So let us begin. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Coleman. Coven. Excellent. Good evening, family. I'm Reverend James Cruz from Antioch Baptist Church. I have the honor of doing roll call. You know, our goal was 400 people, 400. We right now with Zoom and live stream and everyone here, we're up to 610 folks. Right. Amen. And we also have 100 people right here live in person. GCC is, it consists of Baptist, AME, Jewish, synagogues, you name it. We're all here, one family. We have a new congregation that's come aboard and that's Middleburg Heights. They have 15 people that have registered, amen? Yeah. Just, to, just to name a few with the numbers that they have, Cole Halib has 12. West Shore has 22. Come on, yeah. Fairmont, Fairmont Temple has 52. Uh -oh. Antioch, hello. Oh, come on, girl. Has 70, oh, seven God. zero. Yeah. <laughs> the Catholic for GCC has six. Oh, 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 I apologize, Pastor Lynch. Come on. The home team. The home team. Oh, this is the home team. Right. They have 60 people registered. <laughs> You know, we have a combination of judges and elected officials and foundation leaders. I say welcome. God bless you. Amen. That's great, Reverend Cruz. Thank you for that good news. You want to hear some more good news, GCC? I didn't even hear you on that. You want to hear some more good news? All right, that's what I'm talking about. Not only did GCC survive the COVID years, we thrived. We raised more money than at any time in our history. We initiated dollars for doses. We got COVID testing expanded. We fought for our democracy. We opened the first diversion center in the state of Ohio. We lowered energy costs to churches who joined the Power Up movement. And we grew. We grew. How many organizations could boast growth during a pandemic? Tonight, GCC wants to welcome two new members, Reverend Cruz mentioned one, to the GCC family as we continue to build power and to, bri and to bring equity and justice to Northeast Ohio. I wanna to welcome tonight the Centers for Families and Children, Denise Horton, Center Director, Joseph and Emily, who work at the centers are here to represent. 
the center was a key part of GCC's testing and vaccine action. And also we wanna welcome Middleburg Heights United Church of Christ, expanding GCC's footprint on the west side. And I hear that Associate Pastor Susan Prey is here and always so grateful to Russ Smith who got the GCC ball rolling. So anyone from Middleburg Heights Center, stand up, let's give it to you. And I'm going to invite our candidates to introduce themselves or uh, here this evening. Um, hold on a second. And I'm going to have you one at a time, just introduce yourselves and come to the microphone and let us know who you are as we uh, prepare for the first part of our action here. Good evening and thank you for having this event this evening, GCC. My name is Pamela Hawkins and I am a candidate for Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court Judge. All right, thank you. Welcome. Good evening, uh, thank you for having us tonight. I am really um, honored to have the opportunity to be here to listen tonight. My name is Ann McDonough and I am running for Juvenile Court Judge term beginning January 1st, 2023. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Greater Cleveland Congregations. My name is Tracy Martin Peebles, and I am currently running for the seat being vacated by the Honorable Judge Michael John Ryan. I am his magistrate right now, and I'm glad to be with you tonight as well. Thank you. Good evening, church. My name is Ratanio Rucker, and I am running for the Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court Judge. I am running for the seat that is being vacated by Judge Michael Ryan. And I bring you greetings from my pastor, Father Gary Chamora of the St. Adelbert Catholic Church on East 83rd between Quincy Avenue and Central Avenue. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Lentz, I'm going to have you come back up and present our issue agenda, right? Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And of course, we will introduce the candidates for county executive at just a little bit later time in the evening program. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm Reverend John Lentz. I'm co-pastor along with uh, Reverend Dr. Veronica Goins of Forest Hill Church. Welcome to you tonight. You know, the framers of the Constitution base their work on some profound spiritual values of right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Over 225 years later, we are still fighting for, that, for those values. Am I right? We are still bending the moral arc of the universe. Am I right? Tonight, we're going to continue the pursuit. I was so uplifted and inspired by the words of my, my dear pastor brother, Pastor Joanza Colvin. So thank you for your words. We're gonna stay true to our values as we lift up our agenda for 2022 and beyond. Because we believe that public safety is absolutely crucial for vital communities. Yes, we appreciate the work that the police and the judges and the prosecutors and public defenders do to keep our community safe. But please, God, let us make sure that we are smart on crime, not just tough on crime. My friends, we value our children. Can I get an amen on that? Yes. Our children and youth deserve a bright future. They deserve to be treated humanely with fairness and respect, even when they have made some bad choices. We know, now listen up, we know that the average human brain is not fully developed until the age of 25, and the children have a higher capacity for change than adults. 
We know that the significant majority of middle and later adolescence youth will self-desist even if they have been violent and persistent offenders when younger. We know the young people locked up as adults on the average are 34% more likely to reoffend. And we know <laughs> that children and young people placed in adult jails, and I want you to pay attention to this, are 36 times more likely to die by suicide than those who are in a juvenile detention facility. And so if we know, then why don't we make the change? I mean, we understand attention. GCC leaders know, you know, we know the tension of this moment, the opportunity that is before us. We have tools that are not being used to address serious youth crimes, ones that can keep communities safe, while offering children real chances for correction and rehabilitation. And these alternative actually cost less taxpayers money. We value investment. GCC wants to see every neighborhood prosper and grow with thriving businesses and adequate housing for all. Do you want that? Okay, listen to this. GCC values one Cuyahoga County and not the tale of two Cuyahoga County experiences. <laughs> one where businesses are planned and built and the other where jails are planned and built. One where children live in communities that represent the promise of the future and the other where children's lives are shaped by the hopelessness of the cradle to prison pipeline. We value investment in our neighborhoods where plans are created with the residents rather than plans created for them. Plans that bring creativity and imagination, the same kind of energy is when we are wooing major corporations. We demand that this county invest in all the communities. GCC's agenda not only values some children, it values older adults from Lee Harvard and Fairfax and Cleveland to neighborhoods in Lakewood and Cleveland Heights. We are losing our seniors who cannot find adequate housing, forced to move if they can afford or remaining in their two-story homes, fearful of falling, a fatal injury or worse. Our senior population is increasing and Cuyahoga County needs a strategy that moves beyond high rises and nursing homes or ignores the issue. We need single family, single story, handicap accessible residential homes. We value our seniors and need the county to act on this value now. So we believe children and families should thrive. One of the key responsibilities under the county executive is to support and co the continuation of health and human services. And we want to see adequate investment in services for families as they navigate challenges to receive support or programs to ensure a quality of life for their children. So this is what GCC believes in. These are our values. These are our positions. These are the things we're gonna bring and take to the voters for this 2022 election cycle and beyond. Investment in all neighborhoods of our cities as Cuyahoga County continues to develop and grow. No more trying children as, as young as 14 years old as adults, putting them in adult prison, shame. We demand intervention, diversion, and trauma-informed care for youth in the juvenile justice system. So GCC, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? We know, we know what to do. Now let's go do it. 
our personal pain is transformed to anger. And anger is transformed to power. Power to change the world as it is to the world that should and can be. Let's take joy in this work. Come on, let's go. Thank you. Um, Definitely yourself. <laughs> um, good evening, GCC members, honored guests, and all the in attendees here in person and virtual. Uh, I want to thank you for attending the Battle for Democracy action tonight. My name is Antoinette McCaw. I'm a member of Olivet Institutional Baptist Church and a teacher with the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. <laughs> For almost two decades, I have taught students who live in poverty, experience trauma, such as abuse and neglect, and some even made bad choices in high school. The past six years, I have witnessed three of my students be bound over from juvenile to adult court for their unlawful actions. And yes, their actions cause trauma. I too know what it feels like to lose a loved one to senseless violence. So let me be clear, I am in no way justifying their actions or trying to minimize the pain, the pain my students caused, but they were still children. They were funny and helpful, grumpy in the mornings, irritating to me, but they worked hard to get their work done, especially if they knew they were failing. Those were the students that I knew. They had hopes and dreams, just like any other child. Hopes of becoming a barber or an NBA player, even though their basketball skills may have not been that great. <laughs> but they were still hoping that one day they could make it. And who was I to tell them that they couldn't? In my classroom, students are able to share their future aspirations. It's a safe place where every person in the room is valued and treated with love and respect. And no, it is not always easy, but it is worth the time and energy. Isn't everyone deserving of that? Yes, that's right. Yeah. My students were not monsters. No. That tough guy attitude was often a shield to hide years of depression, anger, hopelessness, drug use, and needing a sense of belonging. Trauma and stressful experiences will cause behavior and emotional problems. They were still young and immature. And science tells us that children do make bad decisions. I know when I was a child, I made some bad decisions, didn't you? My students got caught up caught up in the wrong social circles, dealing with peer pressure while trying to provide for their siblings because their fathers were either in prison or their mothers may have been addicted to drugs or alcohol. Now, Cuyahoga County, they have a drug court that gives adults second and third chances. Why not my students? A youth bind over occurs when a prosecutor charges a youth and the judge transfers a child's case to adult court to be tried and sentenced as an adult. If that youth is convicted to a prison sentence, that youth will serve time in an adult prison. Is that fair? You just heard Pastor Lentz. It's outrageous that Cuyahoga County leads in youth bind overs that our county transfers the largest number of black and brown youth to the adult court more than any other county in Ohio, more than, more than Hamilton and Franklin counties combined. 90% of youth bound over to the adult court system are people of color, but only 30% are county residents. Why the racial disparities? Currently, there's no policy or plan in place that exists to examine those racial disparities 
or to reduce youth bindovers. Why? That must change. Don't get me wrong. I know public safety is extremely important. It's important to residents and for businesses to thrive. I respect everyone's position of authority, elected officials and public safety positions. I respect them. I know it's not easy. I spoke to a CMSD graduate who's a police officer in the fifth district. She said her job is not easy, it's stressful, it's dangerous, I get it. But yet and still, despite that, she still comes in and speaks to the students because she turned her life around. And I'm gonna tell you that I want you to know that most of the youth can too. They can turn their life around. We need leaders who will be leaders who will use successful evidence-based interventions for a high risk youth. Interventions that get results, especially when the current policies have proven results of failure and not success. I wanna live in a safe community, just like the next person. But we need elected officials to find alternatives for youth who commit violent crimes. The research, the research has shown that the county has tools that are not utilized to address youth crimes, tools that can keep our community safe while offering our youth successful interventions. What would you do if it was your child? Wouldn't you want that? In the words of former President Barack Obama, Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Right. Now, I would like to introduce you to a mother whose son has been transferred to the Delk Court and if you could all lift her and her family up in prayer and welcome Mrs. Moore. Good evening, I'm Miss Moore. The lives of my family and I were deeply affected by the bond over of my son. At just 15 years old, the juvenile court determined that my son was not able to benefit from rehabilitation in, a, a, in the juvenile system and transferred his case to adult court. I didn't understand how and why a child would be placed in a system that deals with adults, treated as if he were an adult and placed in adult jail. My son suffered from a learning disability depression and anxiety. He was also dealing with PTSD after witnessing a traumatic death of someone close to him. This was his second case, his first felony. His only other charge was a disorderly conduct. I brought the charge against my own son thinking I was doing the right thing. As he gotten older, I started seeing, I started seeing a change in him and he started hanging in the wrong crowd. As a concerned mother, not sure how to help him, I reached out for help from the juvenile court, which I now regret. Not me trying to get him help, but me turning to the system for help. I had asked for help from, for my son for, from multiple agencies, CFF, CFS, New Direction Treatment Center, anywhere I could think of, turning to the juvenile court was my last result. They used my statements to determine his bond over. He was participating in treatment and services and trying to make hard to make better choices. But the juvenile system didn't care. Anytime I reported that he had any slip ups, no matter how minor, they used it against him to say he couldn't change. This really took a toll on our family mentally and physically. As for me, I was angry. I was scared. And most of all, I was hurt because I thought the system had my back. I was, the, I was disgusted with the system for not 
for not acknowledging the effort of a desperate mother and not foreseeing the progress my son has been making. I was lost for words the day they, the day they decided to buy him over. I was in disbelief, couldn't understand what was taking place. I was scared and worried for my son being in prison with grown men. The day my son went to juvenile court hearing, I cried my heart out sitting outside the courtroom. Not being able to assist my baby was the worst feeling because he needed me. In the end, the juvenile, in the end, the adult court gave him a six year sentence, adult prison sentence. With that sentence, he have could remain in juvenile court and not been bonded over as an adult and made to feel like he was hopeless in a lost cause because of one bad decision he made when he was forced into a terrible situation. An adult prison environment is extremely dangerous for children. They are more likely to be assaulted and attempt suicide and to be placed in solitary confinement for their own protection. My son and other juveniles in adult prison are offer few to no programs. Will my son's IUP be enforced by the Ohio Department of Corrections? Will he get the mental health service that he needs to help him overcome the trauma he has experienced? In Ohio, 81.3% of children were bonded over were black. In Cuyahoga County, the percentage is even higher. Why? Mm -hmm. I wish the system would have looked at my son as a person, a growing child who is a human being, not perfect, but he's not a lost cause to be thrown away to the adult system. All they saw was my son charges. Yeah. I wish they would have looked at the circumstances surrounding his charges and the fact that he was only 15 at, at the time. Yeah. I wish they would have looked not just at my son's slip ups and mistakes, mm -hmm. but at the willingness to continue to try to be better yeah. and at his progress and his success. It is too easy for the system to bond over children like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. It should not be so easy to look a child in the eyes and tell them that they are too bad for juvenile court mm. and they deserve to be punished and treated like full grown adults. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for that story. I know it wasn't easy for you. But to our candidates, our position is simply this. We want to change the practice of transferring children as young as 14 years of age of, um, to the adult court system for discretionary bindovers, but keep them in juvenile court system. While in juvenile court, we want require them to have um, alternatives such as crisis interventions, diversion, and trauma-informed care for our youth. Now the questions, and I know each candidate was given the questions prior to this event for uh, pre preparation for the response. You will each have 90 seconds to respond to all three questions. Okay. If you continue to the general election, will you attend GCC's public hearing on juvenile bindovers in the fall of 2020? If you are elected, will you meet with GCC by March, 2023 to discuss juvenile bindovers. What commitments will you make to prioritize keeping children in juvenile court and minimizing the number of youth bound over? Thank you for this opportunity to address you. My first commitment is that I, if I'm continued on to the general election that I will attend the public hearing in the fall of 2022. Right. I will meet with the GCC if I am elected by March of 2023. Further, my commitment is to trauma-informed care for our children who come through the juvenile court system. While yes, I am an attorney, I have been, I am a former prosecutor. I am also a social worker. I spent 12 years 
working with the children and families in Cuyahoga County. My entire career has been working with this county. My goal is to ensure that families, not just the children, get the supports and services they need. Because if I'm just addressing this child who's in front of me on criminal charges, that doesn't mean we're going to improve their situation should they end up going to DYS and then coming home. We need to make sure that families are connected with services, that the families have the supports they need, and that everything is in place for this child so that they can do, be successful. They can meet, their, their needs are met, not just the families. But I think as a juvenile court, we need to work with the entire family unit and ensure that their needs are met. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanna thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for sharing. It hurts my heart to hear that you turned to juvenile court and were disappointed by your experience and that needs to change. And I don't want a family to ever feel like that. I work at juvenile court and I'm running for juvenile court judge because I believe in the mission statement of juvenile court, that we are there to serve and help and support families, that we are there to ensure community safety and that we are there um, to rehabilitate juveniles. And that juvenile court is where it is best to rehabilitate juveniles. I think that, um, that I would need would want to build use our juvenile justice system to build up our families and youth. And the best way that we can do that is we need to do a better job of catching uh, youth at their very first contact in court and implementing services. Then we need to identify family trauma. We need to identify substance abuse and mental health issues at that time and wrap the family at that time. We need to keep improving um, family-based treatment, that has been shown to be more effective. We need to tap into untapped uh, neighborhood resources that is within the youth's own uh, neighborhood because um, and we need to start a community-based restorative justice program. We need to keep expanding our early intervention and diversion center, which we have had success. 85.1% of youth who have been in our early intervention diversion center have not reoffended in nine months. The court is sometimes only involved for a couple, a couple months, and we need lasting resources within the community that will help the family in the long term. Thank okay. you. Okay. Wait, wait. Before you oh, go. Yes. I oh, and I forgot. I yes. forgot to answer question one and two. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. If I could just really quick say that number one and number two, absolutely. And I would like to even extend. I, if I am elected. I would like to invite anybody to my courtroom anytime to come for a week, come for a month, come and, and let's listen and talk. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so with regard to the first question of whether I would attend the public hearing on juvenile bindovers in the fall, I would be so disappointed if I were not allowed to attend those hearings. I mean, I think it's necessary to have all perspectives at that hearing and I, and I would be um, honored to attend. Um, so yes, I would definitely come and attend the hearing. Um, and then as far as the second question, if elected, will I meet with the GCC? Absolutely, it says by March of 2023. Um, absolutely, I'd like to start January off with a meeting of the GCC. And lastly, what commitments will I make to prioritize keeping children in juvenile court um, and minimizing the number of youth bound over? So what we do know for sure is that we have, um, to be more proactive with our youth. We know that we have to um, implement innovative initiatives, which I have a track record of doing. And my priorities around being proactive would be in maintaining public safety while also keeping children safe. Because one of the issues that I often have from the bench is seeing children out at two and three and four o'clock in the morning and wondering, how we how safe are we keeping children in the community when they're not involved with the court? Right. Additionally, mm -hmm. I am the reentry court magistrate, and I believe in an expansion of specialized dockets because they do.
do give direct and specific services and treatment, and we are seeing such good results. Um, I would like to eliminate gaps in service on the front end so that we don't have kids reoffending and coming back because there was a box that wasn't checked on a form and a mental health service wasn't provided or drug treatment wasn't provided. I want to make sure that we don't have any incidents like that so that cases don't come back to us because we didn't do our job the first time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the people here and in Zoom. With respect to the first two questions, my answer is whether I'm elected or not, I will attend both conferences because it is consistent with my vision of community service that I have lived all my life. And those conferences present issues that I feel we need to address. So it doesn't make a difference. It's not about the election. It's about our children and our families. With respect to the last question. I agree with everything that my colleagues here have said, but as a magistrate of over 14 and a half years with the juvenile court, I have seen a number of different things. And one of the things I have seen is that sometimes we use not evidence, but hearsay to commit children downtown. Mm -hmm. Sam Amata is the head of the public defender section at the juvenile court, and he has been in my courtroom and he knows. I require the prosecuting attorney's office to present evidence or else I will not find that child guilty, period, end of story. With respect to our 14 and 15 year olds being bound over, I believe, sincerely believe that if you give me alternatives to consider, I will most definitely make the commitment to consider those alternatives. Why? Because I have actually written an opinion that talks about how children, their brains, actually do not mature until they're 25 and things of this nature. And that opinion was upheld by my judge and it was never appealed by the prosecuting attorney's office. These are things that I believe in. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Each candidate, you will have one minute to uh, clarify your response. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. As clarification, one of my goals in becoming a juvenile court judge is I believe that one of the things I bring to the table is a diversity of experience, <laughs> a 30 plus year commitment to this county, to the families and children of this county, and that I will continue that commitment if I am elected as juvenile court judge. My goal is to work with the families, to work with the children, to rehabilitate our children, give them the opportunity to become positive and productive members of our society so that they can, and I'm gonna say this wrong, but so that they can do what they wanna do, so that their hopes and dreams don't die. Because that's one of the things I see with the kids I work with every day as a private attorney and guardian ad litem is that my kids don't think they've got anywhere to go. Why should I change? Because you do have somewhere to go. And I want to further my ability to encourage them to maintain their hopes and dreams. Thank you. Um, if elected as judge, I love this type of event and this type of conversation. It is so needed. And this is the type of judge that I would want to be. I would want to be out in the community. I would want to be out in the schools, out in the rec centers. I would want to be out anywhere that will have me. And I want to be out listening. And I want to be transparent. And I want to know that you to know that judges don't know everything. And that the way that we're gonna learn and the way that we're gonna solve problems is together and continuing the conversation, doing it together. And I would share uh, my colleague, Mr. Rucker's um, consideration that I wanna be in the conversation whether elected or not. And I would promise to uh, serve every day with this kind of passion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
So thank you again so much for this forum and the opportunity to talk about these issues. I know that we've talked a lot about bindovers and I, I did do some looking at the stats and I do know that because our filings are down, our numbers on the bindovers are down as well, but not to the extent that of course we would like to see. So I would like to also commit to coming to those hearings whether or not I am elected. And um, I just wanna say as it relates to this issue with regard to the discretionary bindovers, we do have a big role that we play as judges on those in using our discretion. And I do intend to use my discretion um, and not just looking at the severity of the allegation, but looking at the child, mm -hmm. looking at the child's social and emotional history, being trauma informed, mm -hmm. being evidence based, using techniques that will specifically address the concerns that are in the room. The child's response to treatment is a big factor. But once again, when services are exhausted, through graduated sanctions and more restrictive placements, even coming home, where does everyone return to? Home to the community, bringing children home to job referrals, education referrals, mental health referrals, substance abuse, helping people to transition into adulthood and the most productive and healthy and whole way possible. As it relates again to my priorities, I am a fan of specialized dockets and you will see me as a judge expanding the specialized dockets as well. So thank you so much. As a juvenile court judge, it would be my responsibility as it was as a juvenile court magistrate for over 14 and a half years to be fair and impartial, to do the things that are necessary to be done, to make sure that each child that comes before me and their family receives the services that they need. These are the things that I did do. These are the things that I will do. Also, I am aware that what the court does is a back-end investment. We need more front-end investment from our community leaders and from our community organizations. We can only do so much. We, whoever is elected, we only have so much discretion that we can use. We must follow the law. If you want direct changes, then you need to go to the General Assembly down in Columbus, Ohio, and you need to talk to your state reps, you need to talk to your state senators, and you need to get them to change the law as it relates to 14 and 15 year olds. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, in the end, we are trial attorneys or trial judges, and we must follow the law because there is only so much we can do. So I am asking you, for your front end investment to help us on the back end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, judicial candidates. I, I realize that I want to reiterate your names as I kind of send you out and invite our county executive candidates up. I just want to remind everybody, these are our uh, judicial candidates for the Cuyahoga County Court of Pleas for the Judicial Division. We have Pamela Hawkins, Ann McDonald, Tracy Peebles, and Ratanya Ruckel. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to invite our county executive candidates to come to the stage. Um, Chris Ronain, Tariq Shabazz, and Lee Weingart. Tariq, can you tell me that I pronounced your name right? Tell me your name. I did. Okay, I pronounced it right. Tariq Chabaz. <laughs> Thank you. I want to talk about the power of the county executive, the office of the county executive in Cuyahoga County. Um, it is a very, it's a powerful position. They have the power of the purse. 
the power, uh, the county executive has the power to invest in neighborhoods, to play a role in our justice system because their budget, his budget in, in this case, his budget oversees the court, the prosecutor and defender's offices, as well as the transit system, to name a few. The position writes, manages, and oversees a $1.6 billion budget for our county. $1.6 billion. The executive has the health and human services levy as a tool, as a gift, as a tool to build and design and enforce a safety net that will catch people when they're falling, not to let them slip through and certainly not to strangle them. GCC, we have people in our county who are falling through the net. Mm. We've heard about them already this evening. We'll hear about them more, especially senior citizens and our children, especially those who are already on the edge and struggling, those who have already had a rough go, those who have already had a tough time, those who are already at risk of falling even harder. The county executive has tools, power, and access to money, to funding, to make sure that they do not slip through the net. The county executive has an obligation and accountability to citizens and to voters so that no one gets caught up in that net or strangled in it, no one. When we have well-supported and well-funded health and human services and economic development, that takes into account all citizens, the more each person in this county is able to take care of themselves, to take care of their neighbor, and that we together will be a better community for it. I wanna talk about a couple of uh, particular things in a, in a moment we're gonna to mention to you and ask questions about housing, especially for our senior citizens. I'll do that in a moment, but I also wanna mention that the past several years, we as GCC have worked tirelessly, have worked so hard to bring into reality the county, Cuyahoga County Crisis Diversion Center. It's the first in the state. That's right. It's the first, not the only, we hope. It's the first. We've set an example that we hope other counties will follow. And we are still committed to continuing that work to continuing to move the diversion center in the right direction and ensuring that it is operating at the full potential, at the full purpose to save lives. We are committed to working alongside whoever it is that fills that role to move that diversion center even more towards its capacity. I don't have to tell you that, the, that racism is a public health crisis in this county, in this country. We've already heard this evening about bindovers in the criminal justice system. We've already heard for far too long about the disproportionate impact of so many elements of our society on black and brown people, citizens in this county. And we are tired as Pastor Lentz said earlier, we're tired of the tale of two county experiences. Right. One where you get a second chance and one where you never got a chance to begin with. Come on. Yeah. I wanna talk about housing for a moment um, across GCC and I'll say, um, you know, I never introduced myself. I'm Reverend Joanna Diagostino. I serve Lakewood Congregational Church in Lakewood, Ohio. Um, across the county and, and specifically in cities like Lakewood and Cleveland Heights, we are losing our senior citizens, our seniors, because there is no way to age in place. That's right. There is no way to age in the communities in which they have been invested for so many years and that many of them helped to shape. 
neighborhoods like, uh, like Lee Harvard and Fairfax and Cleveland, and cities like Lakewood and Cleveland Heights lose seniors who cannot find adequate housing, who cannot find single level housing, who cannot find accessible housing. Every year, seniors are forced to leave their neighborhoods for other cities, for nursing homes, or remain in their homes, but fearful of falling, of fatal injury, or worse. Our seniors deserve more. They've given us so much. They've invested so much in their, count, in their cities, in their communities, and an investment in senior housing, both public and private, is urgent as our senior population increases. We need more single family, single story, handicap accessible residential homes. Right. We value our seniors. The county executive with the power of the purse, with that $1.6 billion budget mm. has the opportunity to bring solutions, to bring ideas, to bring plans. And we have the power to build relationships, yes. to work together, to let you know of our hopes and our dreams that they might match and come to meet together with your solutions. We have the opportunity together in partnership to make the solutions come to fruition. I'm going to invite up a, um, a speaker to talk about that aging in place situation and that uh, housing struggle that we have. Um, if you'll just give me a moment. <clears throat> I need a little bit of water. And then, uh, or should we do it? Are we doing introductions yeah. first? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna invite you to introduce yourselves, each of you. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, <clears throat> it's not COVID. I'm gonna invite you to come up and introduce yourselves. You have 90 seconds, um, as you know, uh, to do that introduction. I want you to let us know who you are and, and just 90 seconds to introduce yourselves and, and then we'll uh, have that testimony in a moment. I don't mind starting first. Go ahead, it's all you. Number one, I want to say good evening, everyone. My name is Tariq K. Shabazz, and I'm running for Cuyahoga County Executive. Um, I want to say that I, I did make an error in, in judgment in terms of my attire today, but I don't want you to <laughs> you miss. Look, look <laughs> but I don't want you to misconstrue or, or perceive that that is an error in judgment and what we need to be doing differently. Mm -hmm. See, as I walked in through this door, I heard the phrases of the two tails of Cuyahoga. And I know all too well about the two tails of Cuyahoga because I grew up in that two tails of Cuyahoga. Yeah. See, and if and I was listening to you, ma'am, exactly about everything you said. And what you said is powerful. And it needs to be more than just words that just hits on deaf ears. It needs to be words that actually translates and segues into actually making policy changes. So what I want you all to understand today is what I stand for is I'm against mass incarceration. America, we are 5% of the world's total population, yet we're 25% of the world's imprisoned population. Mm -hmm. And when you look at these communities all throughout this country, the majority of those people who are incarcerated happen to be Black. Mm -hmm. And I hate that we have to assure and have to address the realities that are so, so bad. But the reality is we have to make this change. So I say that we must remove the underlying conditions that leads to the crime. Mm -hmm. So. I am saying this, and I don't know about my other colleagues here, but I stated that I said on day one, I'm addressing that housing is a right, which means that we will make the proclamation and we will make that transition to make sure that everyone here has a guarantee to have a home because no one should ever have to worry about living on the street. No one should ever have to worry about the house, the insecurities of not knowing when they're gonna eat or where they're gonna lay their head. But I assure you, I can't wait to speak a little bit more throughout this time. All love, all love. Thank you. <laughs> Well, good evening. My name is Lee Weingart, and I'm a candidate for county executive this year. I am a lifelong resident of Cuyahoga County. I was raised in Cleveland Heights. My uh, wife, Caroline, and I've been married for 28 years. We have three children. We now live in Shaker Heights. I'm a, uh, we're members of Fairmont Presbyterian Church, and our new pastor, Ryan Wallace, is with us tonight. All right, 
Good to see you, Ryan. Uh, I am a former county commissioner. I'm the only person on stage tonight that's held county office. When I was county commissioner, we had big problems. We turned a $114 million budget loss into a $40 million budget surplus without raising taxes. I'm coming back now 26 years later because the problems have gotten much bigger and much more important than just a budget. We have systemic unemployment, poverty, hunger, and hopelessness in our county. And for 25 years, since I left county government, the same party has tried to address those challenges and has failed. So I've got different ideas of what we can do to address those challenges. And we'll talk about it a little later when I answer the questions. But the bottom line is this, we need to invest in our urban core. We need to generate wealth that starts and stays in the urban core by expanding private housing, by focusing our job creation efforts in the urban core, and by creating an entrepreneurship fund to help urban entrepreneurs form and grow small businesses. That's what I'll do as county executive. Thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, GCC. I'm Chris Ronane. I'm a candidate for Cuyahoga County Executive. Thank you for what you do. I and my wife, Natalie, live in the city of Cleveland. We've lived our whole married life together in the city of Cleveland with our two kids, Audrey and Joseph. We want the same for them that you want for your kids. I've been lucky to live within four blocks over 25 years in the city of Cleveland because I started out in an apartment at $275 on West Boulevard. I moved to a double on Clifton. I moved to a single bungalow and my, I asked my kids, where do we want to live as we grow further as a family? They said, right here in this neighborhood. So we've lived our lives together as a family in a Cleveland neighborhood. I started out in graduate school at Cleveland State University. I had a half hour coffee with Carl Stokes. He changed my life. He said, change comes in inches in this town. It motivated me to do more, to work faster, to build trust. I went on to the Cuyahoga County Planning Commission, worked for Cuyahoga County. I was the chief of staff at Cleveland City Hall where we saw a billion dollar budget and ably administered it to our neighborhoods. And I worked the last 16 years as the president of University Circle Incorporated. I want not to be judged by our brick and mortar. I wanna be judged by what we did with our kids. We worked with thousands of CMSD kids every year to give opportunities to make sure they had vocabulary at age five, 500 words, that they were reading with comprehension in the third grade, that they were looking at job opportunities through our circle connections in their high school years. And I talked to them frequently. They've gone on to colleges. They've gone on to work opportunities. It's what I want to see for all kids in the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County and beyond. Thank you, Chris Ronane. Thank you. In a moment, we'll have more questions. But first, I'm going to invite SK Dunlap from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church up here to share a story. Good evening, candidates. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kay Dunlap, and I'm here to talk about the issue of the importance of investments in options for senior housing. Homes. Homes build streets. Streets build neighborhoods. Neighborhoods build communities. Communities build thriving cities. Notice the first word, homes. For most of us, our homes are our sanctuaries, our sacred spaces. For many citizens in our county, however, the freedom to remain in our homes as older adults is simply not an option. I know, I've looked. When I gather with friends of like age, the question of where will we go when we can no longer remain in our homes for whatever reason is a frequent topic of conversation. We are all painfully aware of the paucity of affordable single living, single floor living in my low to moderate neighborhood. We are not alone. The numbers tell us that at this moment, there are 46 million older adults living in the United States. Between 2020 and 2030, the last of the baby boomers reaching 65 will increase that number by 18 million. By 2015, it's projected to reach 90 million. 90 million, that's a lot of old folks. <laughs> Those numbers are staggering, but clearly the evidence is in front of us every day. Look around. 
We are a graying America. For sure, the, ages have had, the aged have had much to contribute, and they've given back much to their communities. But we have not given them anything back in terms of the ability to find an affordable senior housing, and that is undeniably tragic. Further, it's an equity issue because many low, moderate income, low to moderate income communities and neighborhoods are predominantly brown or black, such as the one where I happily reside in Cleveland Heights. GCC is committed to opening the options for senior students and residents. Yes, there's new apartments for seniors. Yes, there's plus 25 or 55 developments, but quite frankly for me and for many of my friends and neighbors, we don't find these alternatives appealing at all. We don't want to leave. We don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> Instead, we want to stay and to stay with options close by supported by health and human services. We are desperate for investments in our aging neighborhoods by our county executives. For me, this story is personal. In my earlier work with GCC Housing, the study in Cleveland Heights, our team identified 80 vacant lots in the Noble neighborhood of Cleveland Heights. I'm sure that there are many other vacant lots scattered around our county. Every time I think about this, every time I think about that empty lot down the street, every time an older neighbor moves away, I think, wow, they could have been living on one of those lots. They could be close to the neighborhood they've grown up with, where they've walked their dog, where they raised their families, where they've supported one another in the ups and downs of everyday life. Isn't this what it means to have a quality of life as we get older? It's really about relationships vital to mental health. Think about the lockdown during the pandemic. Who did you miss? I suspect you missed your family and your friends. I certainly did. I felt this loss greatly. I still feel this loss. The loss of affordable senior living is important. It's an investment. We need to use our hearts and our minds and find the commitment to do much better for our seniors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you. I'm gonna ask our questions of our candidates and you can come up one at a time to answer them. Again, they have received these questions in advance. I know their time allotment. Um, and we'll have an uh, extra minute of clarification after all three of them are done, um, if, they, if they'd like it. Um, so uh, Chris and Tariq and Lee. Um, our first question is, will you work with GCC to strategize on senior housing for Cuyahoga County residents to safely age in the neighborhoods of their choice? Our second one is, will you meet with GCC by March 1st of 2023? to develop a long-term county plan for increased neighborhood investments, for continuation of funding for the first crisis diversion center in Ohio, and for reduced juvenile bindovers. And the third question is, <clears throat> the excessive use of juvenile bindovers in Cuyahoga County and its disproportionate use with the black children needs to be urgently addressed, as you know, Will you undertake a comprehensive review of our county's juvenile justice practices to maximize evidence-based community prevention strategies and family-centered responses to children, to children's misbehavior and report back to us by March 1st, 2023 with your recommendations for change? Thank you. <clears throat> Number one, both of my colleagues are a lot taller than me, so I'm going to have to yeah, <laughs> <laughs> add a little levity in here as we're talking about something very serious today right now. <laughs> All right. So uh, as your next Cuyahoga County Executive, number one, I would like to say that's a yes to all three of your questions. Um, and I want to speak a little bit more to the people here so you can understand, again, why is it that this, this young man is in front of you asking for your vote? Not just because I'm just running but it's because of serious issues that we need to address. For instance, we're talking about this jail, the jail issues. If you just saw, we had the steering committee in the county was looking to push out to, to pick a new direction or a new place, a location for the jail. 
And I was one of the mem- one of the individuals that was there and I spoke out against it. And, and I want you to understand the reason why I spoke out is not because I just want to talk loud. It's because I'm willing to put in that work because I will be a fighter. I'm willing to address these insecurities, nail on the head. We have to make sure that we can no longer go on this path. So I've immediately opposed all privatized prison systems all throughout the, uh, throughout the country. So I want to make sure everyone understands the reason why for that is because the financial status of these prisons are what is actually predicated on the basis of, the, it's based on the money of them bringing in incarcerating people. So they advocate for occupancy rates. Mm-hmm. And now some of the things we're looking at even in our county right now, specifically about what our jail, we're talking about increasing the size of a, of a, of a facility that is gonna house almost double the amount that it should, that we are currently supposed to be having now. Do so we have to ask ourselves a question, everyone here? Are we answering our insecurities with incarceration? Mm. See, I know I'm running out of town, but listen, we got more. Yeah. You got to be listening to me. The fight is on. Please, please give me another minute later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're good. Yes, yes, and yes. And thank you for those important questions. Our seniors, our individuals with mental health challenges, our children that our society has failed. In many cases, our most vulnerable populations that our county must first address their needs. On the issue of senior housing, my colleague, you said it all. It's all about inclusionary housing. We need to make sure that our zoning codes are allowing our seniors to stay and live in place. We will usher in fix-up funds, as I did in University Circle. We will make affordability, working with the Cuyahoga Land Bank, a priority. We will usher in complete communities where people can walk to where they need to be, where they get transportation access. I will have a mobility division at Cuyahoga County and a housing division. As far as communities go, I've, I've expended my whole career working on neighborhood investment. We will invest. We invested $16 million in the senior housing on Mayfield Road, the Abington Arms in University Circle, working with partners to help with fix-ups, to help with fixtures, to help with modernizing their facility. And it's 100% occupied and affordable and subsidized today. The issue of bindovers, I will advocate downstate with every judge, thank you judges who want to do that with us. I will be with you in Columbus. We need to solve this problem. I will say to the issue of gun violence and to the issue of this crazy permitless carry, end it. It's killing our community quite literally, end it. I will be there with you. And finally, absolutely, we need to approach justice first, not just as a jail, We need to approach justice with prevention, with diversion, with mental health services. I like what I'm seeing in Shaker Heights with a care team approach. Why don't we do that in all 59 communities? We will in my administration with you. Thank you. Thank you. On the issue of senior housing, of course, I'll work with you on that. And I'm already proposing, I think, a very radical approach. So I believe the best place for a senior to stay is in the house where he or she lives. But it's harder to do in Cuyahoga County because of rising property taxes. So I'm proposing the following, a rollback and freeze program for seniors at least 60 years old who make less than $50,000 a year in Ohio income, uh, Ohio income, we will roll back the taxable value of your home to the 2021 uh, pre-21 level and freeze it at that level until you sell or the house transfers. That ensures Level property taxes for seniors going forward, keeps them in their houses longer. On neighborhood investment, I'm not waiting. I've already proposed the most far-sighted uh, view of neighborhood development of anybody in this race right now. A $600 million program called 10,000 Homes for Cuyahoga County to have 10,000 families on the east side in the first ring suburbs build, buy, renovate, or repair a private home that they own. I talked about job creation. 4,000 jobs in the urban core. I'm committed to in my first four years as county executive. I talked about entrepreneurship, a $10 million program to help urban entrepreneurs create 250 new businesses to keep people uh, to work. And on juvenile bindovers, it's a very important issue to me. When I am elected county executive, I will have a variety of committees put together 
took a justice uh, issues across the board, starting with bind over and at the coming back into the system uh, as ex-offenders and expungement. So I will work with you on that. Would anybody like an ex uh, another minute? You'll take them. Take all the minutes. Yeah. Thank you. All right, sorry about uh, my words getting a little conflated out here today, but I want to make sure we speak about some of these issues. Again, I'm Tariq K. Shabazz. I'm asking for your vote on May 3rd for, to become your next Cuyahoga County Executive. I want to make sure that we're addressing the underlying conditions that lead to so many of these conditions that we're at right now. The conditions of proximity are scarcity. There's scarcity. There's a lack of resources being actually implemented and appropriated into these communities. So some of which some of people have heard me already talk about one of our plans is the green line. And the green line is gonna be the very antithesis of what redlining has done into these communities. Now, what that process is gonna do is we're gonna make sure we expand our amount of funds that we can actually go to these communities that have directly been marginalized so they can actually buy their land so they can have more funds for their rehabs, for their homes. See, we're talking about our seniors maintaining the, their assets. So it's not a liability when they pass it to their, to, their, to, their, to their kids. See, and those are the things that we have to be forward thinking on. As your next Cuyahoga County Executive, I also want you to know that I will create a what is called the Cybersecurity and Innovation Department. This is gonna take us into the, the next century and we're gonna become the next hub of cybersecurity. And we know these things are absolutely imperative to make sure we're changing now. So I wanna say thank you again. I appreciate you all for your time out here. I'm Tariq K. Shabazz and please reach out. Let's make some change, all right now? I just want to bring up two additional subjects. One, the jail. Keep fighting for justice. I am not convinced yet. I am not convinced that what is being proposed right now in Cuyahoga County is the right course. What you have done with the diversion center, keep doing it. Let's make more and more diversion centers. I'm with you. I want to just finally also tell you a story about the kids that we've worked with over the years in University Circle. We set up a Circle Scholars program after school when all the yellow buses went to all their distant places in the region. Our kids in our immediate neighborhood studied with us after school from two o'clock to five o'clock in our museums. This summer, we brought TANF dollars from the state of Ohio to keep them learning in the summers. But what we learned is what you know, they've been experiencing trauma, trauma in their lives that we need to get in front of with preventative work from the very day they're born with their moms, thank you, Ms. Moore, and with their families, we need to be working with our kids to keep them out of the system that we see out in the Fairfax neighborhood. Divert, divert, let's work on it. Thank you. All right. Let me just add something on my housing initiative and why private housing is so important to me and I think to the community. First, private housing stabilizes families. This is the lesson of the book Evicted, if you've ever read that. If you can stabilize a family in a home, they can focus on job training, getting a job, and their children's education. Secondly, private housing creates wealth in communities that have not seen wealth in over 100 years. And that is the best way to fight poverty and crime in those communities. And then thirdly, private housing makes communities safer. When you have a piece of the pie, when you have a house, when you have a job, you have more time to spend on your block to make sure it stays safe. This is why, to me, private housing is the answer to so many of the challenges I talked about at first. The federal government, 90 years ago, offered guaranteed mortgages for white families in America. And 90 years later, the average white family is worth $240,000. Black families did not get those mortgages, and the average value, uh, a net worth of uh, black families is $24,000. We can change that calculus by my program to bring private housing to the east side of Cleveland and the first ring suburbs. Thank you. Now I'm gonna invite Vicki Jackson up, Evangelist Vicki Jackson up from Elizabeth Baptist Church uh, to uh, bring us into a commitment uh, to engage members and expand our voter base. Thank you. Um, should we go back or should we sit down or should we stand up? Thank you. Good evening, GCC. I'm a neighborhood captain and a member of Elizabeth Baptist Church, Pastor Richard M. Gibson. 
In 2021, I became involved in GCC as a neighborhood captain, engaging voters to show up at the polls and volunteering at the polls in person to validate the number of voters who did follow through. A neighborhood captain receives a list of voters in low turnout areas to build a relationship by making calls and sending postcards to ensure voters to vote. I was proud that me and the relationship with my other neighborhood captains worked and not, and not in vain, but was a total success. I was happy to get to know several voters and candidates up close and from a distinct perspective. As a new neighborhood captain, I was excited because I was a vote and I voted faithfully. On the other hand, I was so out of touch with the political arena. I was convicted on how little I really knew about the candidates, not even what they looked like. There were life-changing issues that would affect our city, our state, and most importantly, our youth. Yet I did not have the slightest inkling. What were the factual issues? What were the pros and cons of this or that candidate? I just voted because it was my right and I kept it moving. I must be transparent. When I became a neighborhood captain, it increased my participation in GCC. I attended the teach-ins on criminal justice. My thoughts before where I am not going to jail, who becomes judged does not really affect me. If you do the crime, you do the time. I had no compassion, no empathy for lawbreakers. Because of GCC, I had the privilege of hearing dynamic speakers from the judicial system and a frustrated, broken Miss Moore. My mind and my heart change. When I go to the polls now, I do care who is elected. It matters a great deal. I can make informed choices and I, be I believe will affect the results for me and my neighbors I desire to see. It is easy to sit on the sidelines and say this should be done or that should have been done. It is easy to criticize from the sidelines and cry if I were in office, I would have handled that crisis more competently. competently. It is easy to sit out the election saying my vote would not matter anyway. It seems to me these are defenses not to participate in resolving our neighborhood disparities to shift the responsibility, if you will. That was me, but the time has come for me to take responsibility for what happens in my community and work with others to make real changes in our democracy. To that end, I strongly implore others to join me and become neighborhood captains. We are our brothers, our sisters, and our neighborhoods keepers. Right. We must be just as concerned that residents who have a have vote get the opportunity to be heard about the voting process. If we want significant, productive, long-lasting changes, we must commit to informing and urging people that have given up on the system. They must continue to speak up and speak out through their voting privileges. Yeah. We hear them, we support them. How? By becoming a neighborhood captain and leading the charge with them. You won't be alone. And we learned from our work in 2021 to engage deeper and build our work out further. In 2021, we targeted five neighborhoods and contacted close to 5,000 voters in low turnout areas. This year, we want to expand further. We want to have captains in five additional suburban low turnout areas to make a real impact in this election. Each of you in person and on Zoom have a commitment form. In order to hold these candidates accountable, we need to be accountable as well. Being a neighborhood captain helps to increase our voting turnout base. We need 150 neighborhood captains. Please fill out your form you have in front of you or electronically by Zoom. Lastly, we will begin this training early this year. Join us April 23rd in person for a neighborhood captain training with West Virginia Can't Wait, who increased double digit voter turnout with their neighborhood captain model. We heard from you how we can do our work better and we are making it happen. Join us and join me as we continue to fight voter suppression and voter depression in Cuyahoga County. Thank you. Don't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll invite you as you are able, as you are able uh, to stand at your seats. I know it's been mentioned already before, but please know that there's a lot of power in this Forest Hills Presbyterian Church, Forest yeah. Hill, <laughs> a lot of power. And there's a whole bunch of power going on throughout this county, through GCC, people watching on Zoom, hundreds 
of folks watching on Zoom. And we welcome you, you are part of this community right now. So thank you all for being here, being with us. Even in this broken world, this time of year is a time of reflection, of renewal, of redemption. Our Muslim friends are in the midst of Ramadan. Our Christian friends are in the period of Lent and followers of the Jewish faith will be sitting at Seder tables marking their festival of freedom next week. In the Torah, our freedoms are certainly hard won. And after crossing the Red Sea, the ability to sustain freedom required adherence to law. It was the rule of law that held our communities together. And this is still true today. Just like in the Torah, this country, the state, and yes, this county is built on the notion that we are a nation of laws. But freedom for all is only possible when we build a communal tabernacle. Picture that. A communal tabernacle in Northeast Ohio, worthy of God's blessing. But if our laws and our interpretation of them do not reflect this sentiment, this tabernacle, then if not now, when? If our laws bind our youth to the same punishment as adults, then what in the world are we teaching our children? If our laws do not help the neediest in our midst, then what will and who will? Sadly, if our laws do not keep all of our citizens healthy, safe and upright, then those very same citizens opt out of the democratic enterprise. We at GCC do not believe it has to be this way. Our policies and rule of law should and can reflect a more perfect world and yes, a more perfect union. God of all, God of all, we know there are many paths to you right here in this space and all around the virtual universe. We take many paths to reach our God. And some of us still have those questions, but there is only one eternal. And that is you, God. We know we have not lived up to all we can be. And that's why our people are hurting. Eternal one imbue our candidates tonight with insight and vision for a better community that they may serve it with justice and mercy. We, the good folks of Greater Cleveland Congregations are praying for them, are praying for you and your families. God, may their moral compass lead them along the way and may each follow the righteous path towards the promised land, mm -hmm. a more perfect union. And let us say, Amen. Amen. The assembly has concluded. Thank you all. Thank you, GCC. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Bless you. Thank, you. thank you so we'll much. And tell Elaine hello. Did you see her before? She's been, she's been great.